<clears throat> My dear young people of the United States of America and uh, young people of all the countries of the world who can understand the English language, I am speaking to you today on the birth uh, celebration day of Hazrat Imam Midi Ahrul Zaman because we are close to the 15th of Shaban and uh, I shall be sharing in this speech uh, a few comments of Western philosophers about Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that you may realize that even Western philosophers even those who criticize Islam have admitted many qualities in the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I will share with you certain quotations of Hazrat Ali Karam Lavacho, Hazrat Ali al Islam about the usefulness of knowledge and the signs that we should look for in a believer, things uh, that a believer has in himself, qualities that a believer has and qualities that a believer does not have. Then I will share briefly with you the events of the birth of Imam Mehdi Akhud Zaman and then a couple of questions that my friend in Chicago pointed out that our young people in USA are asking these questions. So the first topic is uh, comments of Western philosophers about Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sir William Moyer, who is an adverse critic of Islam and has left no chance, uh, um, has left no chance to criticize Islam, writes in his book The Life of Muhammad, uh, even though he criticized Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, for many things, but he admits. Uh, that uh, one wonderful quality of Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam was that he was able to bring about union, love and affection between the warring tribes of Arabia. And he admits that the tribes of Arabia would fight at the drop of a hat. They would fight for uh, the most trivial matters, over the most petty matters. They would start fights and the fights, the wars would last for five years, 10 years, 20 years. They would continue for generations. And Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he calls him Muhammad. So William Moyer calls him Muhammad, but out of respect, I cannot call him Muhammad. I can only call him the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was able to bring union, love and affection between the warring tribes of Arabia who were very difficult to bring together. John Devonport, a leading scientist, observed that it must be owned that all the knowledge, whether of physics, astronomy, philosophy or mathematics, which flourished in Europe from the 10th century, was originally derived, derived from the Arabian schools and from Spain. So John Devonport is admitting that all knowledge, all knowledge that was uh, in Europe from the 10th century onwards was derived from Arabia and was derived from Spain. And Bertrand Russell, the famous British philosopher writes that the supremacy of the East was not just military. Science, philosophy, poetry and the arts all flourished in the Mohammedan world at a time when Europe was sunk in barbarism. Now barbarism is a very harsh word. Barbarism means that Europe was like a jungle and the Arab countries had a very refined culture. Europeans call this the Dark Ages according to Sir Bertrand Russell. Europeans call this the Dark Ages, but it was only in Europe that it was dark. Indeed, only in Christian Europe, because Spain, which was under the control of Islam, had a brilliant culture. So these are certain comments of Western philosophers about our Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now I want to read certain quotations of Hazrat Ali al Islam who is our first Imam and who is the successor of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I know that some of you sitting here in my audience or uh, watching my video on YouTube might be Sunni Muslims and some of you might have one Shia parent and one Sunni parent uh, because marriages between Shia and Sunni uh, people are becoming more common. And in fact, I personally feel that this is a good thing because I have seen that the children of parents, if one parent is Shia and one parent is Sunni, then I have, I've noticed, I have observed that the children are not prejudiced. They respect Shia faith, they respect Sunni faith because they love both their parents and so they are not prejudiced people. And I think prejudice, 
prejudice is a very bad thing and it is dividing Islam, it is hurting Islam, it is destroying Islam. So I personally have no objection to Shia Sunni marriages because they are producing non-prejudiced children. So I want to tell you uh, whether you consider Hazrat Ali al-Islam as the fourth successor of the Holy Prophet or as the first successor of the Holy Prophet, but all the Muslims of the world accept Hazrat Ali al-Islam as a great philosopher and as a great scholar, whether Sunni or whether Shia. All the Muslims of the world accept Hazrat Ali al-Islam as a great warrior and as a great philosopher and as a great scholar. And I would say, since I am a psychiatrist and a psychologist, that he was a profound psychologist and a profound sociologist. Hazrat Ali al-Islam has said that knowledge is an ocean with no limits. Knowledge is an ocean with no limits and you cannot obtain all the knowledge of the world. So Hazrat Ali has advised us to acquire only necessary and useful knowledge. Okay, so since knowledge ha knowledge is like an ocean, it is unlimited. So we cannot acquire all the knowledge of the world. And Hazrat Ali has advised us to acquire only necessary and useful knowledge. Hazrat Ali al Islam has also said that we must acquire knowledge because if we are rich, if we are rich, the knowledge is a decor for us. If we are rich, then knowledge is a decor for us. It adds to our personality and to our character. But if we are poor, then knowledge helps us to improve our financial condition. My mother has written these quotations of Hazrat Ali al-Islam and I got them. I got these quotations from her yesterday. And uh, uh, another quotation of Hazrat Ali al-Islam is that uh, the biggest treasure in the world the biggest treasure in the world is that knowledge which the good servants of Allah have read and have distributed to other people. The best treasure in the world, the best treasure in the world is not worldly treasures. It is not a beautiful house. It is not a mansion. It is not a beautiful car or a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce. The best treasure in the world is that knowledge which the good servants of Allah have acquired by reading and they have distributed to other people in mankind. And Hazrat Ali al Islam has said, Talim dena ilm ki zakat hai. When you spread knowledge, you are giving zakat of your knowledge. When you are spreading knowledge, you are giving zakat of your knowledge. So you should give zakat of your knowledge and not just teach others uh, for payment of your services, but even if you are not getting paid any money, you should distribute knowledge because it is the path of your knowledge. Hazrat Ali has said that the position and prestige of a scholar is very high. The position and prestige of a scholar is very high. He has also said that in those societies in which the position and prestige of scholars is not high, it is because the people are ignorant and they do not value knowledge. Hazrat Ali al-Islam has said that one of the signs of a believer is that he always wants good for other human beings. One of the signs of a believer is that he wants good for other human beings. He wants others to prosper. He wants others to have knowledge. He wants others to have risk. He wants others to have health. He wants others to have happiness. He wants other human beings to have all the blessings that they need. He wishes good for other people. Imam Ali al-Islam has also said that a mu'min is a grateful person, a believer is a grateful person. He is not an ungrateful person, always complaining and criticizing and whining and groaning and saying, ye kuni hua, wo kuni hua. And you know, a person who is ungrateful to humanity or ungrateful to Allah is not a believer. A believer is a grateful person and a believer is patient in adversity. When adversity falls a believer, he's patient, he's steadfast. And uh, Hazrat Ali al Islam has said that there are three qualities of a believer. One is truthfulness, one is truthfulness, the other is strong belief, and the third is uh, having less desires for worldly blessings. A believer has less desires for, her, for worldly blessings. And Hazrat Ali al-Islam has said that there are three qualities which do not touch a believer. 
there are three qualities which never come close to a believer and they are jealousy, hatred and miserliness. They are three qualities which are jealousy, hatred and miserliness because the believer is a loving person. Now I will describe the birth of Imam Mehdi Ahru Zaman in five, six minutes because I want to talk to you about some other issues also. It was in the year 255 Hijra. It was in the year 255 Hijra on the 15th of Shaban that Imam Hassan Askri al Islam, who is the 11th Imam of the Ahli Bayt, was expecting an heir to his Imamat. And when his aunt, his father's sister, his puppy, Hazrat Hakima Khatun, was about to leave his house that night, he said, My dear puppy, my dear aunt, do not leave my home tonight. Please stay in my home tonight because an heir to my imamat is going to be born tonight. Hazrat Hakima Khatun was surprised and she said to Imam Hassan Askri al Islam, But uh, who is the mother of the heir? Who is the mother of the heir? And uh, Imam Hassan Askri al Islam said, Narjis Khatun is going to be the mother of the heir. By the way, I want you to know that Narjis Khatun was a descendant of Hazrat Shamun who was the successor of Hazrat Isa Islam, just like Hazrat Ali was the successor of Hazrat Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hazrat Shamun was the successor of Hazrat Isa Islam, and Hazrat Narjis Khatun was a descendant of Hazrat Shamun. So Hazrat Narjis was a very pious lady, just like all the mothers of the Imams were pious ladies. And uh, Hazrat Akima Khatun, uh, the aunt of Hazrat Imam Hassan Askri, Islam was very surprised and she said to the Imam, she said, I do not see any signs of pregnancy. How is she going to uh, deliver a baby? Imam Hassan Askri Islam said that Narjis Khatun is like the mother of Hazrat uh, Musa Islam, just like the mother of Hazrat Musa Islam did not show any signs of pregnancy. And the purpose of that was to protect the life of Hazrat Musa Islam because Firon had ordered all the male children of the Bani Israel to be murdered. And therefore, there, were no, there was no sign of pregnancy in uh, Hazrat Musa al-Islam's mother. And therefore, uh, the same conditions applied to the birth of the 12th Imam because the Caliph wanted to murder Imam Mehdi al-Islam. And therefore, uh, there were no signs of pregnancy. And uh, uh, Hazrat Hakim Khatun, when she heard this, she stayed the night in the house of Imam Hassan Askri al-Islam. When it was close to Subay Sadiq, close to the time of the Azan, Hazrat Hakim Khatun began wondering that the baby had not arrived. And Imam Hassan Askri al-Islam said, don't worry my aunt, the baby is just about to arrive. Hazrat Hakim Khatun got up and she saw Hazrat Narjis Khatun was also coming. And she saw that Hazrat Narjis Khatun was feeling scared and she looked like she was trembling. Hazrat Hakim Khatun gave a hug to Hazrat Narjis Khatun and read Surah Kulo Wallah, Surah Tawheed and Surah Qadr and Surah uh, uh, and Aytul Kursi. And by the way, young people of USA and other countries, I want to tell you that when you are feeling anxious or nervous in your examinations or any other reason, you should read the four Quls and Surah Qadr and Aytul Kursi and it will help you to overcome anxiety. So Hazrat uh, Narjis Khatun knew this, probably because she was from, from the family of the Alibad. So she hugged Haz, Hazrat Narjis Khatun and she read the surahs of the Quran, which are surahs to calm down an anxious person. And then she saw that the baby had been delivered and the baby was doing sajda on the ground. And this is a quality of all the 12 innocent Imams. Then as soon as they were, as soon as they were born, they did, did sajda on the ground. And Hazrat uh, Hakim Khatun, she picked up the baby. And she went to Hazrat Imam Hassan Askri al-Islam and gave the baby to Hazrat Imam Hassan Askri al-Islam. Imam Hassan Askri al-Islam said to his baby uh, that, uh, my dear son, I want you to say something to me. When Imam Askri al-Islam said, my dear son, I want you to say something to me. Then Imam Mehdi al-Islam, who had just been born a few seconds ago, read the verse of the Holy Quran, which says that Allah will make the weak people of the world the leaders of the universe. Allah will make the weak people of the world. 
the leaders of the universe and they will be the heirs of the universe. This is the prediction of the Holy Quran that the day will come when the weak people of the world will become the leaders of the universe and this will be in the imamate of the uh, 12th imam. So now I want to address uh, a few questions that my friend in Chicago mentioned to me that uh, young people in USA are asking about Islam. One thing is that you are studying uh, comparative religions. Now our children in Pakistan are studying Islam yeah. In fact, even the Christian children are studying Islam, yeah, which I think is not fair. I think the Christian children should get a chance to study Christianity in schools. But, uh, you know, all the children in Pakistan are studying Islam, yeah, but you here in USA are studying mostly comparative religions. And in a way, there's nothing wrong with that because uh, the Holy Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, said that the best knowledge is ilmul adyan and ilmul adsam. The best knowledge is ilmul adyan and ilmul adsam. And ilmul adyan means the knowledge of all the religions. And ilmul adsam means the knowledge of bodies. And that is biology. So the Holy Prophet wants us to study all the religions and he wants us to study biology. So uh, the, the, I was saying that um, uh, the question is, uh, what is uh, the question that many young people of USA are asking is, what is the proof that Allah exists? Many young people of USA are asking, what is the proof that Allah exists? Because they are reading comparative religions and because many of their friends are Hindu, Sikh, Buddh, Atheist, uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims. So it is a cosmopolitan, polyreligious society and they are reading also about all the religions. So many of our young Muslim boys and girls have developed a polyreligious mentality. And they are saying, well, every religion is okay. We don't eat, just have to be Muslim. Every religion is okay. Well, the first question that she told me that young people are asking is that we have to prove the existence of Allah. What is the evidence in favor of the existence of Allah? Well, I want to uh, narrate to you an event that happened in the life of Imam Jafri Sadiq al-Islam, who is the sixth Imam of the Alibad. By the way, out of all the Imams of the Alabad, it is the first Imam, Imam Ali al Islam, and the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Bakr al Islam, and the sixth Imam, Imam Jafri Sadiq al Islam, who spread the maximum knowledge among people. And the father of modern chemistry was a student of Imam Jafri Sadiq al Islam, and many of his articles, which are in the universities of uh, London and Berlin in Germany, uh, have uh, uh, knowledge that was given to him by Imam Jafar Sadiq al and he has written in the beginning of those articles that he learned this knowledge from the, his teacher Imam Jafar Sadiq al and Imam Jafar Sadiq al was also the teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa who is an Imam of the Ali Sunnah and Imam Abu Hanifa has said about Imam Jafar Sadiq al Lawla al sanatan lahlakan no man Lawla al sanatan lahlakan no man. If it was not for the two years that I have spent learning knowledge from Imam Jafri Sadiq, then I, no man, would have been destroyed. This is the saying of Imam Abu Hanifa, an Ali Sunnat Imam, one of the four Ali Sunnat Imams. So now I want to tell you that in the book, the Great Imam. There is a book called The Great Imam, and this is about Imam Jafri Sadiq al Islam, especially about the knowledge of Imam Jafri Sadiq al Islam and what he taught people, whether it was in physics, in chemistry, in astronomy, or in Arab Arabic literature. So there was a kafir, a disbeliever called Abu Shakir, who visited Imam Jafri Sadiq al Islam, and this disbeliever, kafir, Abu Shakir, asked Imam Jafri Sadiq al-Islam to give proof of the existence of Allah. Imam Jafri Sadiq al-Islam gave him many proofs and all these proofs were from anatomy and physiology. All these proofs were from anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the study of the structure of the human body and physiology is the structure of the functioning of the human body. Now I want to tell you another very interesting thing. 1200 years 
after this event with Imam Jafri Sadiq al-Islam, when I was a first year medical student, my father one day asked all of us kids, we were four kids and we had a cousin who stayed with us for her education, we were five people in, in total and all of us were teenagers, he asked us to sit down and he asked all of us, he said, what is uh, do you, he said, do you believe in Allah? And if you believe in Allah, what is the evidence that Allah exists? I don't remember the answers of my siblings, what they said, but I remember my own answer clearly. I said to my father that when I study anatomy and when I study physiology, my heart speaks out boldly and clearly that there has to be an Allah, there has to be a creator because the structure of the human body is so fascinating, it is so beautiful that it cannot come into being without a creator. And I said that the functioning of the human body is so fascinating, it is so beautiful that it cannot come into being without a creator. And then another 40 years passed after this event that my father asked this question of me, another 40 years Past. And then I asked my son, who is now in medical school in USA, and I asked my son Asad, I said, Asad, do you believe in Allah? And if you believe in Allah, what is your reason? He said, when I study biology, and when I study anatomy, and when I study physiology, I have to believe in Allah, because it is too fascinating, it is too beautiful. Now I have given you the example of three people. One was an innocent imam, an infallible in, uh, imam, a highly knowledgeable imam from the descent of the Holy Prophet, carrying within his, within his chest ilmil dunni knowledge given to him by Allah. And then there was me, a person who did not have a huge amount of knowledge. I was just in first year medical in Lahore and then followed my son 40 years later who is in medical school in USA. And the interesting thing is that all three of these human beings gave the same answer. So I ask you to think about this. I know that many of you watching this video and many of you attending my uh, gathering today, maybe I will be speaking in Chicago on this topic. Maybe, I hope, I pray that I will be speaking in Chicago on this topic to young people. And. Uh, those of you who study biology, those of you who study anatomy, those of you who study uh, physiology, I think you should tell your brothers, your sisters, your cousins and your friends, what have you learnt in biology, what have you learnt in anatomy, what have you learnt in physiology, especially when you study the endocrines, the hormones, the ductless glands, the hormones produced by the ductless glands of the body, like the thyroid, like the pituitary, like the adrenal glands, and you see how fascinatingly they are all in a state of perfect balance. As someone has said that this is the endocrine orchestra. There is a beautiful, perfect and coordinated balance between all the different hormones of the body. And it is not possible for something so beautiful, so coordinated and so uh, fascinating to be present without a creator. Now my friend in Chicago also said that a lot of young people are asking the question, why should we be Muslims? Why should we not be Christians? Why should we not be Jews? Because when they study comparative religions and when they have Jewish friends, Christian friends, Hindu friends, Sikh friends, atheist friends, then the idea comes to their head that maybe we can be, so, we can be this religion, maybe we can be that religion. Well, I as a a humble scholar of Islam. I would not claim that I am the biggest scholar of Islam. No, I am just a humble scholar of Islam. And I think it would be even more proper to call myself a student of Islam. Because sometimes I have difficulty understanding a topic. And I call one of my teachers, and I have several teachers. So I call one of my teachers or read up a book. In fact, it's easier to call a teacher because it takes a longer time to find something from a book. So. I was saying that Islam is a beautiful and perfect way of spending life. It, it tells you so many details like how to distribute inheritance. If someone dies, how much does the son get? How much does the daughter get? And <clears throat> it tells you how to greet other people, how to respond to the greetings, how to sit, 
how to uh, walk, how to talk, how to uh, eat, how not to eat. For instance, the Holy Prophet said, and Hazrat Ali al-Islam also said, that do not stuff your stomach with food. Just leave a bit of space empty in your stomach. Leave at least one morsel of food space uh, in your stomach. And I have seen that if you leave your uh, stomach just a little empty, maybe space for one morsel of food, let it be empty in your stomach. And don't stuff your food uh, inside your stomach. You can easily lose some weight and you can easily maintain your weight to an ideal weight. And you know, ideal weight will help you to have an ideal health because obesity is one of the biggest causes of illness in the world. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, these three are the mothers of all the illnesses and they are all linked because a person who has obesity is more liable to have diabetes and he is also more liable to have hypertension. And the best cure and the best prevention of obesity is to not eat unless we are hungry. We should not eat unless we are hungry, as Hazrat Imam Ali al-Islam has said. And we should not stuff our stomachs, but just leave a little bit of space in the stomach. So Islam gives us many, many, many details that other religions are not giving. But then the question comes to your mind that why, is, why are the Jews ahead of the Muslims? Why are the Christians ahead of the Muslims? Well, the thing is this. That if a religion is perfect, if a religion is wonderful, that does not guarantee that the Ummah, the followers of that religion, will be wonderful and perfect also. Because to be wonderful and to be perfect, for the followers to be wonderful and perfect, like that religion, it requires self-examination. If we, inside our own selves, do a self-examination and see what is happening inside here, have I done the right thing? Have I done the wrong thing? If we keep checking ourselves every day, every night, if we keep checking ourselves, have I done the right thing? Have I done the wrong thing? Have I done the right thing? Have I done the wrong thing? And whenever we do wrong, we say sorry and we make amends, then we can become wonderful and beautiful people. In fact, Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Meri ummat ki kamzori maal hai. The weakness of my ummah is wealth of the world. The weakness of my ummah is wealth of the world. So obviously, when the weakness of the Muslims is worldly blessings, worldly wealth, then they are going to be greedy.